I was having so much fun chatting with the online worshipers this morning. I'm like, oh, the song is over and I must hurry. Uh, greetings. My name is Andrea Smith. I'm so glad that you are here today. And, and that just was awesome. Thanks for starting off the first Sunday in Advent and the drum solo was just phenomenal. I was like, oh, I just wanted you to keep playing. How many of you saw the opening video with Kermit the Frog uh, this morning? Good. And online worship, I hope you guys got to see that. I, if you didn't get to see it, we'll send it out in tomorrow's devotion. But it's just hilarious, Kermit the Frog. He is just feeling the music, and, and his little hat, his little Santa cap just keeps going in circles. It's just awesome. That's what I felt like out in the hallway. I felt like Kermit with the energy that you guys have brought. So thank you. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and we are talking about bright spots. If it is your first Sunday with us here at West, or if you're newer to West, we're so glad that you have chosen to be here. There are lots of other places that you could have gone this morning or other ways that you could have spent your time if you are worshiping with us online, live. We're so grateful for you. I love seeing your names in the chat room and and we're chatting about what's going to be the opening illustration in a few minutes. So uh, check your chat feed if you're not driving. If you're driving, don't do that. But uh, we love to engage with you online as well. We are, we always do something, uh, not, we try not to do things for ourselves. Uh, so we are doing something for the community during this Advent, and it's called Light Bingo. It hopefully will remind us that in order for, to let Christ's light shine in us, it's about giving ourselves away. And we didn't want to put another financial strain on you. We know that Christmas is, is a financially demanding time of year, so everything on this bingo card is something that you can do. It, it won't necessarily cost you any extra money. I think baked cookies is on here, but hopefully you already have those things at home. But what we want you to do is pick one of these boxes every single day, scratch it off, and then do whatever is under the scratch off. Now, if there's something under the scratch off that you are just appalled by and, and like you don't want to push, one of the things is push a shopping cart in. Another thing is to save water, like when you're brushing your teeth or, or taking a shower, uh, like turn off the water if you're not using it. Two of our partners, our global partners, are in Uganda, and they have shared with us, like, back during the ice bucket challenge, uh, Pastor Jeffrey wrote us, and he's like, are y'all really just pouring water on each other for fun? And he said, we have no water. And so that humbled us and reminded us that that's not okay. And so uh, one of the things is to conserve water. But every single day, scratch off something, do what is underneath it, and then on Christmas Eve or any Sunday after Christmas, bring this back. And we have a gift for you. There's a QR code on the back. It'll tell you how to do the things. And, and it's really self-explanatory. Don and Lane did a great job on this. So grab one of these after worship if you didn't get one before. And online, I'm putting this in the chat room in just a second when I walk back off. And you can go to our website and download it. And we want you to play along as well. We are so glad that you're here. If you're new, stop at our VIP tent out front. Let us know that you're here. We won't harass you, but you'll have the opportunity to let us uh, know if you want to hear from us or not. But we're so glad that you're here. Today, we're going to talk about casting out fear. Thanks. If you have moderate to severe psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, little things can be a big deal. That's why there's Otesla. Otesla is not an injection or a cream. It's a pill that treats differently. For psoriasis, 75% clearer skin is achievable with reduced redness, thickness, and scaliness of plaques. For psoriatic arthritis, Otesla is proven to reduce joint swelling, tenderness, and pain. And the Otesla prescribing information has no requirement for routine lab monitoring. Don't use if you're allergic to Otesla. It may cause severe diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting. Otesla is associated with an increased risk of depression. Tell your doctor if you have a history of depression or suicidal thoughts, or if these feelings develop. Some people taking Otesla report weight loss. Your doctor should monitor your weight and may stop treatment. Upper respiratory tract infection and headache may occur. Tell your doctor about your medicines and if you're pregnant or planning to be. Otesla, show more of you.
So I promised the opening or the video right before the bumper that is a pharmaceutical commercial. It has a point for later in the message. So uh, we did not just have a memory lapse and no online worshipers. Your feed did not just all of a sudden go down. That was intentional. In fact, I'm going to show another one to you later on. Back when I was growing up, you didn't see all those pharmaceutical commercials, and uh, they're interesting. I don't know if you've ever analyzed them, but we're going to just a little bit today because it, it addresses fear, and we just get so caught up in fear, and the whole message of the Christmas season, it packs so many different promises, and like last week, we talked about how hope comes from remembering promises, and when we feel like we've lost hope, if we will just remember promises that have been given to us through God, by God, then we will be able to find that hope, and today we are going to talk about how perfect hope casts out all fear, and we can have hope in the one who, who gives us these promises, and, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of a history lesson this morning from the book of Isaiah. Uh, we're doing Advent a little differently. I'm not just going to talk about the Gospels. We're going to look at the prophets and, and what they said because guess what? Those are promises fulfilled, and we can go back and look. And that's what those Scripture books in our Hebrew Scripture, the Old Testament, that's what they're relevant for. Uh, they're not like a, an exact historical account. I mean, it's people's memories, and, and they were not chronicling it uh, all of it for us to look at, you know, multiple thousands of years later and rely on it as exact hi history. There are a couple of books like Kings and Chronicles and the story that I'm going to tell you about today with Isaiah and the prophecy that he brought to Ahaz, King Ahaz, that is chronicled more in Second Kings and Second Chronicles. And I invite you uh, during your, your time this week to go and read those books and you'll read like a more historical account of the war that they were in and, and where these prophecies prophecies come from. And today we're going to look at a passage that perhaps you have always attributed to what Matthew and Luke said, you know, she's going to give birth to a son and and name him Emmanuel. And Actually, that was from Isaiah, but he was talking to a, a group of people and trying to give them hope. And then when Matthew and Luke, when they were writing their Gospels, they're like, do you remember? Do you remember this happened too? And maybe, maybe this could be happening again. In fact, not maybe. We believe that this happened again. And so we have this promise and this hope that has been fulfilled. So uh, we're going to look at that in just a second. But before that, I don't know if you can see, uh, if you can see online or not, but what I have in my hand is a little personal light bright. How many of you have ever had your very own light bright before? Will you clap? How many of you never had a light bright? Okay, so uh, it goes both ways. Same was true in our online worshiping and, and our online campus this morning. Uh, so I should have known, and in thinking and pre prepping for this opening illustration, I had some personality revelations, and I'm like, man, I should have probably had therapy as a small child because, like, now I can look back and see I was messed up. So uh, I had a light bright. It was one of my Christmas gifts, and I loved it. You could have this fresh piece of black paper, and next week I'm going to have a, a physical light bright up here on the stage, and, and it's relevant to the message next week, but it could have this, pe this pristine piece of black paper, and then these beautiful little pegs, and it had a light bulb in it, right? And so if the light was on, when you took those little pegs and you punched a hole in the black paper and then put the peg in there, it would light up. Now, when you got your light bright back then, they, and I assume the same is true today, each peg had a special color. And then on the paper, there would be a little bitty letter. And so it told you where to put the colored peg. And I mean, I guess you don't have to, like there's no light bright police that are coming around to check to see if you do it exactly like you're supposed to. But this is where it goes back to my personality. Like, I had to do it exactly the way that they said. So if there was an R for red and I made a mistake, I just couldn't get past it. Like, to me, if I had put the peg in a hole, especially if I really made a big mistake and there was no light there, I'd 
today, I'd be like making the whole thing something different, and I'd just change it all. But back then, I was so like OCD, I guess. Like, I had to have it perfect. And if I didn't, if I messed up, I threw the whole thing away. And that's, that's so wasteful. But the biggest thing that I think is relevant for us, like when we think about a light bright and bright spots and lights in our lives, is that, you know, once you punch a hole in the black paper, you just can't make it dark again. Like, I mean, you can try, you can take the paper off, and you can smooth off the back, but once that darkness is penetrated, the light will always shine through. That is the message of the Advent and Christmas season. That if we will allow the light of God as revealed to us through the person Jesus of Nazareth, if we will let that light penetrate our darkness, there is nothing, nothing that can, that can smooth it over to keep the light out. Once we penetrate the darkness, the light will always be able to come in. I want to show you a map this morning to get started. Uh, and we looked at this just a little bit last week. And, and this is a history lesson. And it, I don't normally go into history, but bear with me for just a minute because this is so important. Another thing I want to share, and, and I share this every year on Christmas Eve, like wherever you come to faith at, or if you're not even a person of faith at all, and you're just listening to this message because you Googled something and it took you there, or if you are here, in person because somebody else made you come and you really don't want to be here. I understand that. And I understand that we don't all buy the virgin birth narrative and, and all that kind of stuff. But this story, it, it's so powerful and it has historical ties, like real historical ties. On Christmas Eve, actually, I'm going to show you some artifacts that were excavated in the 1800s that are walls of a temple of a palace, actually, walls of a palace that was destroyed during some of these wars that I'm talking about. And I'm going to sh show you some of the, the carvings on those walls. It's just fascinating to me. Like when we read this and then we see actual historical evidence that it was real and true. I don't want us to throw away these beautiful lessons and these beautiful promises because maybe we get hung up on the literal nature of some of the verses in Scripture or we, we miss the big picture of the story because we get hung up on what religion and what man has done to the beauty of God. So bear with me for just a minute for a little bit of a history lesson. So like when we talk about Israel... We understand, and especially like now in this time of war there, like their land was so critical, is so critical to them. And back in the, you know, years 730 to 770 B.C. and even before that, like the way the land was divided is certainly not the way that it is divided now. The period in history that Isaiah is talking about in his book in the Hebrew Scriptures, it was in the mid-700s. It like is 770 BCE and, and goes back to like 730, 740 BCE. And, and during those years, there was such, such unrest. And so you've got these kingdoms. And like this yellow kingdom is the kingdom of Israel the purple-pink kingdom is the kingdom of Judah. Now, up here, like right above Israel, this is the kingdom of Aram. This is another kingdom that comes into play during this. And there were so many other kingdoms. I don't have them all drawn on the map. You would get lost in, in all the minutia and all the details. But one other thing, like right down here where you see this black mark, those were the Philistines. That's where they lived. And then the Moabites were down here. There were a lot of ites down then and, and, or during that time period. And I can't remember them all, and I don't think you really care. So just know that like all this geographical region, they were little bitty kingdoms. 
Now, the biggest thing is up here at the top of the screen. This is the kingdom of Assyria. It is modern-day Iraq, Turkey, and some of Syria. And it was the most powerful kingdom that existed during the time. And like right here, right above Israel, is the kingdom of Aram. Then you've got Israel. Then you've got Judah. Now, these three folks, they were aligned in that they were descendants of Abraham, who is one of our forefathers in the Hebrew scriptures, where God came to him and said, look, you're going to be the father of many nations and many tribes, and, and I want you to leave where you are and go inhabit this land. So we did, and that's where the 12 tribes of Israel come from. That's where 12 of the kingdoms come from. And, and you know, then they didn't always get along, and they'd fight each other and overtake the land. So where we come to the scripture this morning in this point is you have the kingdom of Aram, the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom of Judah. Now, those are aligned in their, you know, their love of God and that they are Israelites and, and people of God. And up here you have that kingdom of Assyria, and they are by far the most powerful, powerful kingdom of all. They have the newest and greatest technology. You use that word loosely back in the 700 BCEs. But they had the best weapons, the biggest armies. And the way that they became so powerful is that their king, he had this brilliant idea that he was going to charge all these other kingdoms, these small little kingdoms, taxes. And if they paid their taxes, if they paid their dues to the Assyrian government, then he would not overtake them. He would just leave them alone and let them be. Well, the kingdoms of Israel and the Israelite people, they didn't like that. They didn't want to keep paying the taxes. They, they were frustrated, and so they were like, you know what? We're, we're not going to do this. So the king of Aram and the king of Israel, so the, the top one and then the yellow one, they got together and they said, look, I'm tired of this. He's a bully. What if we unite our two kingdoms together and fight him? And they were like, okay, we're in it together. And then they decided, well, let's also ask the king of Judah. Let's ask him. And, and if all three of us band together, then surely we will be able to conquer the Assyrians. So they go to the king of Judah, and he's like, uh, no way. I'm way smarter than that. There's no way that we're powerful enough to overcome the Assyrian Empire and the Assyrian army. So count me out. It's a hard no. Well, those two kingdoms, they got back together. This is like middle school lunch table conversation, like let's gang up against this person. And so these two kingdoms, Aram and Israel, they get together and they're like, you know what? We will just go take over the kingdom of Judah. Like, I don't care that he's a part of our alliance and our tribe and all that kind of stuff. We will go overthrow him. And then, once we overthrow him, and we've kicked him out, which actually means kill, but once we've kicked him out, we're going to put our guy, our yes man, in power. And once we get our yes man in power, then the three of us can conquer the Assyrians, and it will all be ours, and we will live happily ever after. And that's where we come to our story in the book of Isaiah. This is taken from Isaiah 7, and I invite you again, like after worship or later this week, go back and, and read all of this. Isaiah is such a beautiful book. He's a prophet with, with God's heart, and he's just trying to give them hope and remind them of God's promises. He is writing about the time that Ahaz is in power, and he's writing to or speaking to Ahaz which is chronicled. During the time that Ahaz was king of Judah, the attack was getting ready to happen. When the Davidic government learned that Aram had joined forces with Israel, Ahaz and his people were badly shaken. And listen to how they describe how afraid they were. They shook like trees in the wind. They use that language to convey just how deep the fear was. So God told Isaiah, 
Go and meet Ahaz. Take your son with you. Meet him south of the city at the end of the aqueduct where it empties into the upper pool on the road. And tell him this. Listen. Calm down. Do not be afraid. And don't panic over these two burnt out cases. They talk big, but there's not a lot to them. Aram, he's plotted to do you harm. They've conspired against you, saying, let's go to war against Judah. Let's dismember it and take it for ourselves. But God says, it will not happen. Nothing will come of it. If you will take your stand in faith, and if you don't take your stand in faith, you will not have a leg to stand on. God spoke again to Ahaz and this time said, ask for a sign from your God. Ask for anything. Be extravagant and ask for the moon. And Ahaz said, I would never do that, God. I'd never make demands like that on you. And so Isaiah told him, then listen to this, government of David. It's bad enough that you make people tired with your pious, timid hypocrisies. But now, you're making God tired. The master is going to give you a sign, despite your doubt. Watch for this. And now the words I'm getting ready to read you, they're going to be words that you've heard before in, in the Christmas narrative maybe and, and the Christmas story. But note who it's being said to here, because that's really important. It's being said to a guy who's afraid. He's afraid that these two other guys are going to come and take everything that he has, including his life, away. And he's also scared, and, and you see there's, you know, a little conversation going on around it. Like, he's also scared because he had not been all in with God. Like, that was the whole part of the Israelite story and also the whole part of our story, right? Like, sometimes we're up here and we're all in and we're at one with God. And then other times, like, life happens, we get busy, and, and it's just all good. And so if we're not careful, then that devotion and that connection with God it can, it can drift away. If you are a church person, have been in a church for a long time, perhaps you've heard the hymn, Prone to Wander, like wander away, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the throne I love. Well, that's what Ahaz had done. He had gotten distracted and, and just, we read he was pious and hypocritical. And so, like, when he's facing the fight of his life, literally, He's terrified. And he's like, why would God help me now? I've not been all in with God. But that's the beauty of God. Like, our distance doesn't stop God from being there with us, in us, in and through all things. So Isaiah tells him, the master is going to give you a sign. Watch for this. A girl who is presently a virgin will get pregnant. She'll bear a son and name him Emmanuel, God with us. By the time the child is 12 years old, able to make moral decisions, the threat of war will be over. Hmm. When we've read those scripture verses, when I've heard them before, it's always been talking about Jesus. And this is not to say that they're not talking about Jesus, because when, when Jesus came on the scene, they were still being persecuted. In fact, you know, a couple 700 years flash forward, the temple's been destroyed. They are completely conquered by the Assyrians, and they are totally under their rule. They left the, the map that you see on the screen behind me. It, it changed again, and they lost the kingdom of Judah, and only Israel stood. 
So we believe the gospel stories where they say, you know, like this young woman, she is going to have a baby and you're going to name him Emmanuel, God with us. But what I want us to understand is that the promises were not just for Mary. The promises were for King Ahaz. He had many wives, and in history, if you read the history lessons, you'll see that he had just acquired a new young wife. So odds are that is who they are referring to in this passage. But God promises, like, look, I'm going to give you a sign, and when I give you the sign, you're going to see that you're not alone and that you don't have to be alone and you don't have to be afraid. I am with you. And there's going to be a baby that has the wisdom and the keen insight to come into power. And you're going to be okay. Here at West, we heard this from Adam Hamilton and, and actually many of the history lessons that I'm sharing with you, I have learned from him. He is the pastor of Church of the Resurrection, the largest Methodist church in, in the world, a United Methodist Church. And he is just a brilliant author and preacher. He has so many books about Christmas and, and the incarnation and Emmanuel and, and also not being afraid. He has this phrase that I've learned years and years ago, and we've adopted it as our phrase here at West, and it is that the worst things are never the last things. And then one of, I refer to her as a saint because I, I just think she is Mary Nanny. She is a long-term, long-time member of West. She added to it in one of our small groups that we were in together. She said, and the last things when they are the last things, they are the most beautiful things. That stuck with me. She's so right. But Isaiah was telling Ahaz, like, look, I don't care how much you've screwed up. I don't care how far away you've gone. The last things are not the worst things. And God is going to always be with you. And God will punch holes in your darkness. If you will just believe. The power of the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament is that we can look back. And again, not take it literally. It was not written to be taken literally. But to look back at the story of a group of people. A tribe of people. How they began. Where they journeyed. And how time after time after time after time, God kept God's promises. When the people were freed from Pharaoh by Moses and Moses and Aaron and his sister, when they led them out of captivity and, and they went through some treacherous waters, and then they got to the wilderness, like then they were like, you know, hey God, what the heck, why are you leaving us here? And God gives them enough. He gives them manna and quail so that they'll have enough. God doesn't say, I'm going to give you everything you've ever wanted. But he says, I'm going to give you enough. I'm going to always be with you. I would not lead you here to this wilderness to not lead you through it. And again, as United Methodists, we don't believe that we're puppets on a string. We don't believe God makes us do things. We believe we have free will. And, and the cool thing is all this intertwines with science and, and quantum physics and things that I'm not smart enough to be able to explain. But it's just interesting and brilliant the way that all this in the year 2023 is playing out. And scientists are starting to be people of faith, maybe not in a religious kind of faith, but spirituality and faith because the, the science backs up this energy and this presence of God that we believe lies within. And I tell you that because like, it's easy when we're in the wilderness to think, God, you did this to me. God doesn't do bad things to us. Life happens. Crap happens. We believe that good and evil exist both and that there are two opposing forces in this world. And, and I don't understand it. I won't pretend to tell you that I do. But I know that bad things happen to great, great people. And I know that sometimes we look at things and we're like, why, why did that happen that way? 
But I do know that in scriptures, we are told over and over again that we don't have to be afraid, that God is always with us, and also that God works all things, no matter how tragic and how awful, God works all things together for good. It's true. And if you look in the Hebrew scriptures, you will see that it's true. And, and I could just give you example after example and, and if you've been in church for a while, maybe you remember these. If you haven't been in church, you won't maybe necessarily know the names that I'm talking about, but just know that they're real examples like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery, fiery situation and furnace. And metaphorically, we believe that they faced just horrific, fiery trials, and they made it through. Or that God protected Daniel, when he faced the lions, that he protected the Israelites when they were going into battle over and over again, like they still exist. Their tribe is still here. So even though the periods of darkness and difficulty may not always work out the way that we want them to, they do still work out. And God is with us in and through all things. The light always penetrates the darkness. We just have to remember to connect to it. And the thing that we keep saying here at West is to know that the light of God lies within you. All of us. It's in there. Sometimes we just might have to dig a little deeper to get to it and why is that like why do we feel so disconnected sometimes and afraid well first of all like you know 30 40 years ago we did not have Fox News and CNN or MSN on the TV all the time I'll never forget back uh, when I was pastoral care at Williamson's Chapel I was the associate pastor of pastoral care a gentleman had lost his wife tragically and unexpectedly and and I went to visit with him he asked if I minded if he left the TV on, and I said, you know, no, certainly not. And, and so we sat there, and I think he just wanted some company that day. And we watched Fox News. Now listen, I don't watch any of them because I don't think they all, they all have their own bias and angle, so I just quit watching them all. But um, like 30 minutes watching that, I was so depressed when I left. I mean, turn on the news, you know, uh, WBTV or WSOC or whatever, like at night, and the first, you know, the first 10 minutes are not telling you how amazing the world we live in is. It's about all the things we need to be afraid of and all the things that are bad. We shared with you a pharmaceutical commercial. I want you to watch this next one uh, for just, just a few minutes. Watch it and just see what you take away from it. I can do more to lower my A1C. Because my body can still make its own insulin. And I take Trulicity once a week to activate my body to release it like it's supposed to. Trulicity is not insulin. It comes in a once weekly, truly easy to use pen the pen where you don't have to see or handle a needle. And it works 24-7. Trulicity is a once-weekly injectable medicine to improve blood sugar in adults with type 2 diabetes when used with diet and exercise. It should not be the first medicine to treat diabetes or for people with type 1 diabetes or diabetic ketoacidosis. Do not take Trulicity if you have a personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer. If you have multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2, or if you're allergic to Trulicity. Stop Trulicity and call your doctor right away if you have a lump or swelling in your neck, severe stomach pain, or symptoms like itching, rash, or trouble breathing. Serious side effects may include pancreatitis. Taking Trulicity with a sulfonylurea or insulin increases your risk for low blood sugar. Common side effects include nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, decreased appetite, and indigestion. Some side effects can lead to dehydration, which may worsen kidney problems. To help lower my A1C, I choose Trulicity to activate my within. Ask your doctor if once-weekly Trulicity is right for you.
in trying to make this point, I watched several pharmaceutical commercials, and like, look, medicine is a good thing, and, and we need it, but I would, I'm like, diarrhea, vomiting, an itch, a rash, I mean, you could just keep going, and they're all like that. Every pharmaceutical commercial, and I know they have to do that for liability reasons, but Dog on it. Some of them are so bad. Like, they're, the complications are so bad. I'm like, I would never want to take that. because. And then I would be paranoid, and maybe some of you are too, because we are a people of fear. We live in fear. Like, I'm itching. Oh, dear. How many of us, like, look at the side effects of medicine that we take, and we're convinced that that's what's happening to us because we are afraid? It's so easy to be afraid. But you know what? We live in actually the safest time in the history of our nation. And we live in one one of the, the best times in our world. Like back in the 1800s, poverty was like at 81%. And now, world poverty, and that meant like a the equivalent today of a dollar eighty, like you had a dollar eighty to live on a month, and now that percentage has gone down to twenty percent, eighty percent in the eighteen hundreds to twenty percent in our year now. And then I want to show you something about violence. This is taken from the Pew Research Center. U.S. violent and property crime rates have plunged since the 1900s. I'll send this out in tomorrow's devotion, but you can just look. It's gone down in every single area. I mean, there are horrific things that happen in our midst. Our bishop, our United Methodist bishop, uh, his home, his home and his wife's home was broken into And things were were taken while they were gone. I mean, stuff still happens. But stuff's not all bad. And we think about, like, we are catastrophic sometimes. And we look at something that is small and we make it so big. There's this part in our brain that causes us to do that. It's the amygdala. It's the flight or fright response. And, And we are created that way. There's a whole book uh, written, to, a motivational book to learn about how we, th- we think. It's called The Chimp Paradox. Like, why do we react the way that we do when we hear things? Why are we triggered? Uh, I recommend that book. It's, it's a great read. But this amygdala, it's a real thing in our brains. And like when things happen, we are afraid. It's a protective way that we are wired. But we take it too far. We end up, um, can you finish this sentence for me? We make a mountain out of a, see, we know that. Like, look at a mountain. And now, do we have an image of a molehill? I guarantee you, it's not that size, right? I mean, a mole's a little, cute little animal. They do damage, but they're cute. We do, we make mountains out of things that don't need to be mountains. And another study says that over 80% of the things that we worry about never happen. But we live in fear. In closing today, I would wrestled with what closing illustration to use because there's so many. So many that I could choose from of watching you do your lives and, and knowing, privilege to know your stories and And uh, then I thought, okay, at the risk of being a slimy preacher, I'm going to tell you, and I mean that, and you'll understand why in a minute, but I'm going to tell you something that's just so real right now. And I'm telling you that online and, and here, like, I'm not a slimy preacher. I grew up with my grandmother after my mom died. I stayed with her a lot, and she used to watch Oral Roberts every Sunday morning, and then we'd go to church, and I would, it's probably not kind of me, and I ask forgiveness now, but I'm going to say it anyway, that was an example of a slimy preacher, 
Because at one point in his career, he's like, I'm going to lock myself in this tower until you give all this money. And then once you give it, I'm going to let myself out of the tower. I mean, I think I was like 10 or 12 years old when he did that. And even then I thought, that's odd. That's just odd. Although as I'm saying it, I'm like, well, that's an idea of how we could. <laughs> but then I might like get this low self-esteem complex. You know, like, Y'all just leave me up there. But that's so not true. So I want to give you just a really quick history of West. There's so many of you that are new and you don't know this history. And for those of you who have been here a while, I'm going to tell it fast. So just hang on and bear with me. But about 15 years ago, we were asked by the conference, we're United Methodist Church and proud to be a United Methodist Church. We were asked by our conference, I was the associate at Williamson's Chapel, I'd been there for six years, to start a campus of Williamson's Chapel. They believed that we, uh, the DNA there, and, and we as a, we could get a launch team that would launch a place that would make church welcome for people that were never going to darken the doors of the stained glass and the big columns and, and all the stuff there. That we could create a safe space for people who may be seeking God or turned off to church or religion or even faith. And so that was our charge. Now, when we got started, uh, several mentors, I found some mentors that were church planters, and they're like, look, you're going to get a launch team. Rob Fuquay, the pastor at Williamson's Chapel that gave us the permission to do this and the blessing to do this, he's like, look, I don't want you to ask anyone here to go. I'd already asked Adam, so I'd, I'd broken that rule, but I didn't ask anybody else. He said, you let them volunteer. The right people will come to you. And then my mentor said, of the right people that come to you that are, are, are geared for church planting, half of them will need to go away. And when they need to go away, you let them go away. Because church planting, sometimes it attracts people that want agendas driven. And if they don't get their agenda driven, they're going to give you a really hard time. So let them walk away. I'm like, okay. So over a year, we, we waited. And about 40 people came to this launch team. And then Lance and I went to boot camp in Dallas, Texas. And they were training us how to launch a church. This was in August. We were supposed to launch at Easter. And we sat there and we looked at each other and we're like, oh dear, there's no way we're ready. And so we postponed the launch. Now, along with all this, there's the money factor, right? And that's one of the things that people argue about. And, and we and the Mama Church did not exactly see eye to eye on how much we thought because they still needed money too. And so we got a, a finite amount of money. I think it was around $100,000 to launch a church. And that's nice, except all the stuff you see around like amps and speakers and all that kind of stuff, it cost a whole lot more than we thought it was going to. And, and that was just the only pot of money that we had. So we've already postponed the launch because we know we're not going to be ready. And then we get this quote from a uh, portable church, and, and they it's like three times the amount. And we're like, okay, we can do some of this on our own and outsource it on our own, but where in the world are we going to come up with more money? And then out of the blue, a lady that was a part of Williamson's Chapel but believed in the mission and vision of West, she called me. I had been uh, privileged enough to walk alongside her when her husband had a heart attack and died unexpectedly at the age of, uh, in his early 40s, leaving behind she and three kids. His life insurance had come to her, and she called me and said, I want to tithe it. I want to give West hundred thousand dollars because I believe in the vision sorry my voice crackles and I get passionate about this because I've watched how West changes lives so I'm like all right holy cow God you are in this even though we were afraid and like one other little thing the conference said we want you to worship at Lake Norman High School We've done the research. We know the unchurched population in a 2.1-mile radius. And back then, that's where people would come to churches from. Now we're a regional church. We have people that drive here every week from Salisbury and every other week from Winston. It's, it's powerful. And we're across the globe. But back then, 
2.1 mile radius. I met with the principal. It was so cool. We were in grad school at Appalachian together when I got my master's in education. He's like, absolutely, y'all can worship there. Four weeks later, around the same time that we got the quote back and realized we didn't have enough money, he called and he said, I've got some bad news for you. The Cove asked years ago, and we didn't think they wanted to open a campus here, and now they've decided that they do, and they have first right of refusal. You're going to have to go somewhere else. So we were out of a place, and we didn't have any money. And then the life insurance gift came, and we were like, we'll just find somewhere. We'll find an empty building on Sunday mornings. We were looking at Queen's Landing, and then Ben, the principal here at the time, called me back and said, for whatever reason, they don't want to come. And so it's yours, and let's sign the papers today. So like all those things that would keep us up at night, like they were solved, not easily and not quickly, but there were holes that were punched in that darkness. Then it was time for our first year birthday. We were so excited. We had a big worship experience planned. And, and the week before our birthday, I got a call from a gentleman who used to drive the trailers from Williamson's Chapel to here. And he, it was on a Saturday afternoon. He said, I have some really bad news. The trailers have been broken into, and all of our technological equipment is gone. Every bit. The sound system, the speakers, everything. They had gone through the carts, crafty little folks, and everything was gone. We gathered here the next day, and Rocky Mount donated some of their supplies. They heard about it and uh, donated some of their supplies so that we would have enough to have worship. We didn't have a band or anything. We just gathered in here and prayed. Because again, I mean, when we started, we started not with like a lot of money because we spent what we needed to spend to start. And then West folks that were going to be the launch team, like it wasn't until November that the conference started a checking account for us because we argued with the mama church over money and they're like it's ours until you start and we're like we got to pay payroll and they're like mm. so the conference helped i'm telling you all that because it's really important because you see um two years ago i was driving to baptist hospital somebody had had surgery and i got a phone call from our treasurer and he's like, I have to talk to you. And two years ago, I really didn't get involved in our budgets. It, it gives me anxiety. And so I just trust other people. But I've learned that as the pastor, that's no longer an option. Like, I have to. It's just part of it. I walk alongside other people, but I can't be hands-off and ignorant. And two years ago, I was ignorant. And he said, look... I need you to tell the staff no spending or very little spending in December. I'm like, have you lost your mind? It's December. We have Ding Dong Ditch. We have a Christmas party for, you know, the staff and the leaders. And, and we, we can't not spend any money. He's like, well, the bank balance is 18000 And based on projections of giving, like, and the bills that we already have, I'm not sure we'll make payroll. So there can't be any spending. Now, I don't like to talk about money in here because it's a sleazy preacher thing. Like, I don't ever want you to think, especially now, that I'm telling you this to, like, beat you over the head or make you feel guilty for not giving. We believe that giving is, is out of gratitude for lives that are full and rich and God always provides with us. So we believe giving is a spiritual thing. But I'm, we don't pass the plates. We don't talk about it every Sunday. But I just need you to know that this is like the best example I could think of of fear and being crippled with fear and God coming through. So we went to leadership. I went to leadership. I'm like, look. Here's where we are. And some of our key leaders and our PAC team and the staff, they gave more. We didn't make a big deal about it in the church. We didn't want to, you know, like, scare you. And also, I didn't want to look incompetent. So folks gave, and we made it through. 
And then, last year, I have learned not to answer my phone on November 30th or December 1st because it's just a bad day. Last year, I remember exactly where I was when he called and said, we need to talk. Like, how bad is it? Now, after two years ago, I learned, like, pay attention. And so we did the projection of giving and all that kind of stuff. We don't ask people to fill out pledge cards. And, and we looked at our budget. We knew we were getting grant money. And we also knew that it was going to be the last year. And we're like, oh, this is going to be tight. And I wrote my bosses. I'm like, look, just want to let you know, being fully transparent, like, it's March. If we can continue down this trajectory, by December, we're going to be broke. It came true. On November 30th, December 1st, whatever the day was, got the phone call. I need you to not spend any money in December. I know you've already been really tight this year, but, like, our bank, about, our bank balance is $10,000. Like, holy crap. Like, how? We've tried so hard. When I say I laid awake at night, I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me. It's just true. Uh, because I love West, not because I started it, but because I've seen people be turned away by religion by the bigotry and the hypocrisy that we live in, and I've seen them find a safe space here. So I started thinking about, okay, well, I'm, according like to numbers, maybe a different pastor, a pastor that's cheaper, a pastor that's younger, maybe a better pastor would be the answer. And so I talked to Tom, I'm like, I think maybe this is the year I need to ask to move. And I talked to the PAC team. They're like, I don't think that's the best decision right now. Can we just not jump ship? I'm like, I don't want to jump ship, but, like, maybe I'm not the right one. And I'm not telling you that because I want your attaboys either. I'm just telling you the truth. All this stuff happened, and it was real. For weeks, this stuff was going on. We did put out an ask once last year. We sent one email, and folks responded. Some cashed in stock, some immediately upped their giving. It was, it was enough because we still had um, one little bit of grant money that was going to come. And then it's December, what, today, 3rd? So that means November 30th came. This time it was in a text. I figured it was easier to manage. Hey, what's our bank balance? I thought he put an extra zero. It was $50,000. And that's because of you and us and the work that we do together. Somehow God has worked in your hearts over the year. And you have responded, and the staff have worked so hard to cut down spending. And online worshipers, you guys are amazing. They send those Amazon wish lists out, and you buy so much stuff from that. That in the years past, we've had to spend money on. You buy this stuff. And we have not compromised ministry at all. And our bank account this morning, I think, was forty-three or $44,000. Never, ever has that happened. And so we are going to be able to pay bills in December that we've never, uh, or for the past two years, we've not been able to pay, like our tithe to the denomination, which we're passionate about. And then this week, we're like, all right, we have a budget for 2024. This is what it is. This is where we are. This is where projected giving is. And this is the deficit. And I want to show you what you did. We use a rubber chicken because we have a rubber chicken somewhere, and it says that all people are welcome at West, and it's our little symbol. But I shared with you in the email this week, we have a goal of 75,000. 17 families have gotten us to $26,600 in one week. What an awesome 
thing to be able to look at and say, wow, God, if I had just trusted you, I should have known that it would be all right. So no sleazy preacher stuff, just a heartfelt thank you because we believe in this church and we believe in the work that we do in the community and in the world. We don't try to make ourselves rich or richer or fancy stuff. But thank you for responding. We are so grateful. God punches holes in the darkness. And in that darkness, there is always light. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for being a God of light and a God that holds us when we're afraid. Whatever our fears are, God, you know them. And just as Ahaz, who had wandered far away, was able to say, God, here is why I'm afraid. I've turned my back. You show us that it doesn't matter. You never move. And you are always there to punch holes in our darkness. Thank you for being that kind of God. And we offer ourselves to you. In Christ's name, amen. So don't forget your liked bingo. Do it all throughout the month of December, throughout Advent. And remember, our Christmas Eve service will be here at 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve. We will not have a Sunday morning service. Also, we have this thing called Ding Dong Ditch. It's West version of an angel tree, but West people nominate people that may not necessarily be in financial need, but just need some love at Christmas. Some are financial needs. Some just are, they just need some extra love and knowing that people care about them at Christmas. We have, I think, 31 more names to be adopted. We had over 60 nominated this year. So please, our table is out there in the commons area. Stop and take a look. Support Soul Creations. That's how we support our Uganda campus. And go and have a great week and almost Merry Christmas.